Lecture 17 part B explores Green's functions for the one-dimensional heat equation. Just as for the Laplace equation, the heat equations can also be written down, the solution to the heat equation can also be written down in general using a Green's function for any initial and boundary conditions. The way the heat function is constructed is slightly different from that for the Laplace equation because the first order time derivative enters into the equation. So to, to, to construct the heat function or the Green's function for the heat equation, let us define two linear operators, L1 and L2. You can see that L1 is just um, the equation for the heat equation and L2 is called a joint operator, um, which is different from L1 in the fact that there is now a plus in front of the dt derivative, dt prime derivative rather than a minus that is normal in the heat equation. Given these two operators, let us now construct the combination um, V times L1 applied to the function U minus U times L2 applied to the function V. And this is akin to the Green's identities we've seen previously, except that these two operators are now different. If we do that, then we get, if we explore the first derivatives, we simply get kappa V times UXX. Um, and I'm just forgetting to say the primes for a while, coming from that term, minus u times kappa um, v x prime x prime. Okay, so that's the spatial derivatives, and the time derivatives then becomes minus v times u t, um, min minus, from over there, u times v t. And can, we can then massage this relationship and rewrite it as a full derivative, simply minus uv with respect to derivatives with respect to t, plus kappa vux minus uvx derivatives with respect to x. Okay, and we're going to call that equation 1, um, and we'll integrate it over the domain of interest, just as we did the same thing when we derive the Green's functions for the Laplace equation. Let us further specialize um, the operator L1 uh, apply to U, and we want to write it just as if it is the heat equation we've been trying to solve, so we're going to say that that is minus f of x prime t prime. Okay. In other words, if we then look at L1 apply to U we write, we, and write it out, we'll simply get the expression for the heat equation that we've been using to date, and note that I've switched the position of the x, x, and t um, derivatives because the way I've constructed these um, operators, you always need to have the spatial derivative or the second derivative first. So I'm just adding a minus sign over here to make everything consistent and to keep, to keep with a normal definition for the heat um, equation of ut that we used to. And I'm going to say that you say u obeys the heat equation in x prime t prime, and it has an initial condition where we specified for time equals zero, u is equals to, um, we give the function gx prime, and we're going to say that we have fixed boundaries with x equals to a constant a, um, and x equals a constant b, so the boundaries of the rod that we're exploring the heat on all remain fixed. And on these boundaries, we're going to specify either u or ux, depending on the physical need of the problem we're describing. So this is very similar to Laplace's equation, where we had Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions. And we're once again going to have the idea of a field point where we want the solution to u, and a source point um, Q that we integrate over that the Green's functions equations are written in and explored over and then we're going to integrate that over to actually get the value at the field point. So let's just sketch the situation more completely. Here's our source point Q of X prime T prime. Here's our field point P of X and T where we want the answer. Here is our domain, our initial condition is specified down here, at times t equals to 0, we want p's at times t equals t, 
we have omega, which is this region where the answer is known, and um, lambda is the total boundary, that is the combination of the initial boundary and the initial condition and the boundary conditions over here. Okay, so now let us integrate over the whole domain omega, so this whole thing, and we, we, we simply specified that T prime lies, and we're integrating our source point over this domain, where T lies from 0 to T, and X lies from it, between XA and XB, so exactly what's integrate, uh, indicated in blue. And if we integrate 1 over that domain, and multiply through the minus sign, then we get this expression. Okay, so the first one is the L1 operator applied to U, we've said is minus F multiplied with a minus sign, plus U L2 applied to V, and that is equals to the integral from 0, from XA to XB of UV, which is this term, where we have evaluated the integral over t just by exam or um, sort of finding the value of the derivative at the boundary. So this thing integrated over the domain simply becomes the integral over x that remain x prime that remains. But you now have u v evaluated at t prime is equals to zero and t prime is equals to t. Okay, minus kappa times. Once again, this is a term that's a full derivative, so we can drop the integral over x, and we have that it is u v u x prime minus u v x prime evaluated on the boundaries, but then we still have to integrate over time, so it's from 0 to t dt prime. Okay, so this is roughly the Green's identity for the heat equation. And what we're going to do now, and we're going to call this equation 2, which we're going to simplify further, um, is we're actually going to define our Green's function. And we're going to define the Green's function as V equals to G of um, your field point P and your source point Q, where the derivative operator L2 operates on your source point. Okay, so L2 of G is equals to 0 over the domain, and g at t prime equals to t, in other words g, when t prime is here on your upper lid, is just the delta function of x prime minus x. Okay, and we're also going to seek a function g that specifies the boundary condition um, g x of x a and b is equals to zero if u has been specified on the boundary, and uh, or g of x is equals to zero if u x is specified on the boundary. In other words, you choose the boundary conditions to vanish on g corresponding to the boundary conditions that you prescribed for u. So, given that de those definitions, we can now simplify two further to actually get an expression for our field u at point x and t. Okay, before we do that, there's an intermediate step. Let's examine this expression over here. Okay, so the expression of that term, u of g evaluated at t equals 0 and t prime equals t, you get to benefit from the fact that we've defined or found g that is a function that obeys the delta function at x prime minus x when t prime is equal to t. So this first term over here is simply u multiplied by the delta function of x prime minus x integrated over um, x prime, which is just the function itself. Okay, so u, um, so this first term is simply u of x and t minus the remainder at times t prime equals to zero, so that's simply g of x prime, because on the initial condition we have that u of x prime zero is simply g of x prime, so that's where that term comes from, and then we have that this is g of x t x prime multiplied by t prime equals to zero. Okay, so that simplifies this, this term over here in equation 2, and we're now going to rearrange equation 2 
so that we explicitly write down an expression for u and x and t. And to do that, what we basically do is we say u of x and t, we take is equals to this guy over here. We take that term to the other side as well as this term to the other side. So what we then get is that u of x and t is equals to this term. So that's equals to the integral from xa to xb, g prime, um, g of xt, x prime, and 0. That's basically taking into account the contribution of your initial condition of u, plus the integral that takes into account the source contribution. So that comes from this whole integral over here. We know that L2 a pi to g is equals to 0 by our definition of our Green's function. So that term vanishes. So all we're left with is v, which is now Green's function. So g of your source term, sorry, your field point and your source point that we've, we believe we can find, and we will find it in subsequent um, parts of this lecture, multiplied by f, which is your forcing term. So that takes into account your forcing term's contribution. And finally, we want to take into account the boundary contribution. So we take this term to this other side, and we get that it is simply um, the integral from 0 to 2 g of x and t of x prime t prime at u x prime um, minus u of g x prime x t x prime t prime evaluated at the boundary. So x prime equals x a and x prime is equals to b dt prime. And this final term will we will simplify once we explicitly say what boundary conditions we are um, considering on u. So now once again uh, we have an expression for u that if we given this function g we can always write down this integral expression for any um, initial condition forcing term and boundary conditions. Once again the art is to find g for various boundary conditions and various shapes. Um, but this, the power of it is that once you have it, it's very easy to evaluate what this function u actually is. And we'll look at a couple of examples in this in the subsequent lectures. So the first example is the one that we've already touched on. So I've just rewritten it up here for reference. Um, and that's the one of an infinite domain. So we basically let xa go to minus infinity and xb goes to infinity. We're solving the heat equation equals to a, a forcing function, and we have this initial condition u of x and on, at time 0 is equals to g. And we have the initial, the additional constraint that f and g are bounded. Okay. Um, which is reasonable that because at infinity, yeah, if they explode, you have an infinite amount of heat coming in, you don't want that. It's, it's completely unphysical. So... The reason we look at this problem is it's an idealized problem, right? We very seldom are worried about an infinite rod, but it did make it possible to get the symmetric um, or the self-similar solution, which is equivalent to the symmetric solution found for the Laplace equation. And so we're just going to cast that into the same structure as we have now. And the main thing we benefit is to actually find um, an expression, a solution method that now takes into account the forcing term as well. Okay, so just to recap, remember when we defined the delta function, we defined it as the limit as a goes to zero of a series of normal distributions. Sorry, we didn't define it, we said it could be expressed as that. And in particular, um, we uh, also showed then in that discussion that as the limit as a goes to zero, del this delta function just basically is the normal distribution with a certain standard deviation, approaches the delta function in y. And what we're now going to do is simply use that to construct the Green's function for an infinite domain. So we say let A be equals to 2 times the square root of kappa T minus T prime, um, which is your field point minus your source point's time variable, and Y is equals to the um, source point minus the field point's uh, time, um, position variable. Okay. And if we do that, then we can say let g be equals to gs, which I'm going to call the symmetric solution, or the self-similar uh, Green's function that is valid, that turns out to be valid on the domain, and we're going to say let g 
equals to that. And if I've written it here out explicitly as the definition of GS, we have that is just the exponent of x minus x prime minus x squared um, over four kappa t minus t prime over the square root of pi kappa t minus t prime. And what we can see now, if we define g this way, is that as t approaches to t prime, a basically from below, a approaches zero, and therefore we have that our Green's function, so defined, approaches the delta function, which is, was one of the requirements that we, we wanted for the Green's function. Um, in addition, we also have, if we look at the time derivative, if we take the time derivative of g with respect to t, it's equal to minus g prime, the time derivative of g with respect to t prime. And remember that L2 operator had the sign flipped um, on the t prime. Um, and for its definition in the whole derivation, so that's important. But the main thing we can see here is that because the second derivatives are equal, we basically have that because we know that this expression satisfies the heat equation in time and x, as proven earlier, we now have that, it, it, so that's the um, L1 operator, it satisfies the um, L2 operator in the source terms, in other words, t prime and x prime. Okay, so we basically have that L2 of g is equals to zero as required. And it's obvious that as x goes to infinity, this thing approaches zero very, very rapidly. So both g and its derivative are bounded. Okay, so we satisfied all the conditions we put on our g function in the previous slide for this case where we, our boundary conditions go to infinity. And so we can write down the solution to u just using this general expression we derived above. So the term that takes into account the initial condition is basically this one. You integrate g, um, the initial condition, and effectively you convolve it with this Green's function where I've now set t prime equals to zero. So this formula we have gotten previously. Um, and the additional term we have extra now is takes allows us to solve equations where you have a forcing term and this is given over here. Okay, so here you have the full GS coming in where your T minus T prime and X prime minus X coming in and you convolve it with the forcing term evaluated at the source point. And now intuitively, it's just nice to look at. If you sort of view this GS as in some sense what happens to a kernel of heat concentrated on a single point, it simply spreads out like a Gaussian distribution as the time goes out. What you and then we showed that on, that the contribution from the initial condition is simply you consider every single point of G, multiply it with this on the initial surface, multiply it um, with this function that basically takes that point and spreads it out according to the self-similar solution of the heat equation, and we're doing the same thing over here if we have a sourcing term, a forcing term. So if we add a candle to the rod the effect of that candle providing heat is simply take the candle at every single point and every single time and convolve it with the self-similar solution we found for the heat equation. So intuitively it makes a very, very nice picture of how heat propagates into the actual solution mathematically as well. The one thing that is often useful when evaluating these type of um, problems and taking integrals with Gaussians is to note that this identity holds. In other words, if you take the integral of two Gaussians with different um, standard deviations or different constants A and B entering, and I've normalized both count Gaussians so that their uh, integral over from minus infinity is equals to one, and you fix them or you localize them at different points. In other words, this Gaussian reaches a maximum when Z is equals to X and this one when Z is equals to Y. If you integrate these two things together, then over Z, right, so I've got Z entering into both of them, um, what you then get out is another Gaussian where your standard deviation is now, in some sense, the, the geometric mean of the two. And it's also normalized, and it's just got a different arguments in the exponent.
Okay, so this is a useful identity that you might use in problem six later on. But what I want to do next also is just give you a feeling for the solutions that arise when we actually solve the problem. And I'm just going to look at this first term for now, and possibly you're going to look at the second term during the second term during the problem. So let's just examine this first term. And suppose we have two types of initial conditions. So we have one initial condition that's a Gaussian, basically very spread out, that's G1. And we have a second type of initial condition, which is basically two Gaussians. And then just to show you what the solution looks like for the first one, you basically have this Gaussian where the heat is very, very hot over here initially. And this is your initial condition. And as time goes on, the heat flows away from that um, initial point according very similar to the way that the heat flows away from the self-similar solution over here. Okay, so you've basically taken every single point along this thing, convolved it with your self-similar solution that becomes a delta function at zero, so you actually get this exactly same function back over here. And then every single point you allow to the heat to flow into in time just as a delta function would. So there's a very intuitive way about thinking about these solutions. Similarly now, if you do the same thing with two humps, this is what your heat equation looks like. It looks roughly like a nose. Here's your initial spikes of heat. And as time goes on, they tend to flow out. And eventually the details of an initial sources of heat are lost. And you're just left with a function that indicates that it was the original hot spot was sort of here in the middle. And then drops out cooler to the outside. In fact, you'll notice that the area or the total amount of heat of both these functions were chosen to be exactly the same. So ultimately, you'll lose the details of the initial distribution of heat over here and it'll just merge or smudge out into almost roughly a hot spot on the bar that becomes less and less hot as the heat diffuses or moves through the whole bar. Okay, so now let's look at the case where we have a semi-infinite domain. In other words, we've moved one of our boundaries from x equals to x a equals to minus infinity to zero. We're still solving the forced heat equation or the sourced heat equation and the initial condition. And we now have that f and g are bounded again as x b goes to infinity. Um, but we now are going to have to specify either a Neumann or a Dirichlet boundary condition on x and a. And just to recap, we once again have this self-similar solution that we've derived previously, and we're once again going to construct the solution from the self-similar solution. We, it obeys the, the, um, the operator equation L2 is equals to zero as we want. It also goes to the delta function, which we wanted for our Green's function on the boundary as time goes to um, oh, the, the source point approaches the field point from below. The one thing it doesn't do is because we're specifying um, the boundary condition on u at x equals a, we want either this function or the Green's function or its derivative going to zero. So um, what we're going to do now, and I've just sorry, I've just put in the this derivative of the Green's function, the self-similar solution, we can just write out this way. So basically taking the derivative of G S up there worked it out and then just replaced the exponent back with GS. Okay, so if you see it's just minus two times x prime minus x over four kappa, which has gone with a two, so you're left with two kappa t minus t prime GS. Okay, so now we want to specify Dirichlet boundary conditions. In other words, we specify that u of 0 and t is equals to some boundary condition d of t, and that's given. So our corresponding Green's function, we want that the Green's function at x equals to 0 must vanish. And we want that property in addition to the property that the Green's function obeys L2 and the Green's function on when your source and your target um, your field time becomes similar, becomes a delta function. So if we do that, okay, so we seek the Green's function x prime is equal to zero, and we basically seek that at the, so this is the one boundary condition, and at x prime goes to infinity, we want the Green's function and its derivative to go to zero as well. 
to get rid of basically this term over here at x equals to b. So what, the way we do that is we know that the self similar solution automatically does that. So it would be useful to be able to construct, a co use a combination of these self similar solutions in a way that will permit this to be possible. And we can actually do that. So suppose now we were to set g equals to the self similar Green's function um, that we have. So we automatically obey our boundary conditions as x and x prime goes to infinity. But we now subtract the Green's function where we've replaced x with minus x. Okay, in other words, we have a function that becomes a delta function at x prime equals to x. Okay, where x is greater than zero and x prime is greater than zero. And we're now going to subtract the same function except that we've replaced x prime or x minus x with x. Okay, and just recall gs is exactly this function up here. And note that if we construct it this way, gs still satisfies the, the um, this operator L2 onto GS, regardless of whether we've entered X or minus X into this first um, uh, first variable. Okay, so L2 of G also is equals to zero. We also know that G, as T approaches T prime, becomes the delta function of X prime minus X because this function does. And because x prime or x is greater than zero, right? This thing never approaches a delta function because we never consider that part of the the region. Okay, so we can just ignore that. It adds nothing more to this condition over here. And what we further have is that if x prime is equals to zero, in other words, x prime is equals to zero over there, because this g s um, the only dependence on x is x squared, it doesn't matter whether we've replaced x with minus x. So on the boundary where x prime is 0, g is equals to 0. So we've satisfied this boundary condition. Okay, and once we've done that, we've satisfied all the conditions for our Green's function. And we can now write down the general solution of u of x and t just by this thing that we derived um, for our, using our generalized Green's identities. So we roughly have that the contribution to the um, function is now taking the integral from 0 to infinity of our initial condition multiplied by this new Green's function. Okay, that's the combination of two self-similar Green's function defined previously plus, and that's evaluated at t prime equals to 0, excuse me, and then the second contribution comes from the source term. So this is a full Green's function that we defined over there. Okay, just written out, multiplied by f. And then we now have a contribution coming in from the boundary um, at x a equals to zero. Okay, and just to let let us just look at that condition. At, at x a is equals to zero, we have that g is equal to zero, so this term cancels. We're now left with minus ugx prime, but um, it's evaluated at zero, so there's a second minus, so it's plus ugx prime evaluated at x equals to zero. Okay, and what we do there is basically so u at x equals to 0 is basically the condition that's specified. The plus we've now explained. What the rest is we have to find g of x prime. But we've already got that because gs of x prime evaluated at x equals to 0 is just x. Okay, so that cancels minus minus. So it's x times 2 kappa g of t minus t prime times gs at x equals to 0. So here is our gs of x equals to 0. Here is x times, um, the sorry, this is the gs at x equals to 0. Here is x times 2 times t minus t bar, 
The kappa over here cancels out with that kappa below. So the kappa is gone. And what we also have is this, um, of basically this factor of two that also cancels out because we are considering two times um, the Green's function over here. We have two contributions over here because the derivative of respect to gs of x is equals to minus the derivative of gs of x over here. Right. So this is what we have and the two cancels out cancels out that too. So now let's have a look at the effect it actually has on the solution. Okay, so once again, we're going to look at this initial condition. And I've just shifted the big hump that we had in the previous one from 0 to 3. So we're going to have a look at the effect of this first term over here. Okay, and the important thing is we've changed the Green's function. So we've actually changed the nature of the solution, even though we have the same initial condition. So if you have an initial condition in the case where you have an infinite domain and you have the same initial condition in the case where you have a semi-infinite domain, the actual answer is going to look different. Okay, so here it is. Instead of being that symmetric flow of heat, we now have a slightly asymmetric um, figure. And in particular, if you look here at x equals to zero, right, we have that the heat over here remains zero. Because even though if we consider, so this picture was drawn just with this first term. So in other words, just the contribution over here. And when we do that, we basically have that the boundary condition we've defined here is zero. Okay. So this Green's function makes it possible to write down the flow of heat that ensures the boundary condition remains zero. Okay. So that's an important lesson. The, initial con the same initial condition with different boundary conditions results in a different answer. Now let's have a look, but the intuitive fact of you have your heat source and it flows out, even though it's no longer flowing out according to the self similar solution, but the strange combination of the two, um, it's still intuitively very much like you expect. Similarly, let's now have a look at this, the second case. I'm looking just as this hump at the boundary. So you can think about this as you have, in this top case, you have an infinitely long hurrah rod. And then some point near the edge, you then, um, with, a, with a one point at zero, and you, ha and you started with a hot spot, and this is how the heat spreads out, where you keep the temperature at zero fixed to zero. Um, and in this case, suppose you have a rod that you've started with initially zero temperature, and then at time, sort of starting here at 0.4, you slowly bring a flame towards the end of the rod until it reach, and then you closer and closer until the maximum heat is given to it at um, times t equals to one, and then you remove the flame. The heat will look something like this. You'll start with zero. Initially, you'll make the edge of the hard rod very, very hot, and this will propagate at a certain speed into your rod. And eventually, when you take the flame away, the, the end of the rod cools down again, but the heat still propagates through the rod, and this is what it'll look like over there. Okay. So your Dirichlet boundary conditions basically means, so this is the effect of this bottom term, that you have specified a temperature at the boundary condition. You've actually specified the value of u. So the temperature over here is exactly, or the, the value of u is exactly your boundary condition over here. And this is how it propagates inward. So now let's look at a different case. So once again, we're going to look at a semi-infinite domain. We're going to have our initial and forcing function. And, but this case, and we're also going to construct it out of the um, symmetric Green's function. So you have these properties again. Um, here, once again, is the derivative with respect to x, except that this case, for more complete reference purposes, I've actually evaluated it x prime is equal to 0. So we get this expression that I just discussed in the previous slide. And now on the Neumann boundary conditions, we're actually going to specify the u derivative of x. In other words, we're going to specify how u changes over the boundary. In other words, how the heat is flowing in and out over the boundary. And we're going to give that as a function of t.
So here we're actually specifying the gradient of u with respect to x. And you'll see that come out when I actually plot the plots again. So if we do that, we now want a Green's function such that the derivative of the Green's function is um, equals to 0 when x is equals to 0. And the boundary condition at infinity then remains the same. Once again, if you've made your Green's function out of your self-similar Green's equations, this is automatically inherited from the Green's equations. And then very similar to the case with the um, Dirichlet boundary conditions, we're going to again say if we set our Green's function equals to Gs, which is the symmetric one, and we add Gs but with X, the target term or the field point uh, x value replaced it with minus g of x, then I, I claim we have a Green's function that satisfies all these properties. And once again, you can verify it, right? This first term gives you the fact that as t approaches t prime from below, or sorry, t prime approaches t from below, it has a delta function on the boundary. Both of these functions obey L2 of Gs is equals to zero. The main thing that this thing does, adding this additional function, is it permits you to satisfy the boundary condition. And to see that, note that we want G of x is equals to zero at x prime equal to zero. Here is G of x um, evaluated x prime is equals to zero. We also know that because x when x prime is 0, enter this quadratically, gs of x is equals to gs of minus x at x prime equals to 0. Except that now, here, if you replace x with minus x, you have that the derivative with respect to x prime at 0 here is equals to minus that one. So you've basically shown that gx prime is equals to 0 on the boundary. Okay, and I've just written it out here. So you have gx prime evaluated x prime equals to zero. Here you have the derivative of your first term over there. You have the derivative minus x times th that term. But since gs of minus x and x are the same, these guys are equals to zero. And you can now write down the expression for u of x and t given Neumann boundary conditions. As follows, once again, you have in just simply substitute your Green's function into the top expression. So here's your term from that contributes from the initial condition. Here's the term that contributes from the forcing term. And here is the term that comes from the boundary condition, where we simply put in G over here. Um, just note that we now have minus kappa 0t coming in, whereas the kappa um, cancelled out in the previous derivative, it remains here because we basically want to evaluate the term um, g multiplied by ux, okay, at xa. So that's where the minus sign comes in because it's the first thing. So it's minus um, xa, so that's x equals to 0. g evaluated x equals to 0 is given over here, and then this is the boundary term. And once again, I want to just give you a feel for what's happened. So let us again take exactly the same um, initial and uh, initial condition, and let's look at just look at this first term. So the initial condition is the same; the boundary term is still zero. But let's just look at what the effect is. And if I were to plot the contours of constant heat, it'll look something like this. Now instead of the heat contours avoiding the boundary where it was zero as in the as in the Dirichlet boundary conditions. What we've basically chosen here is we've chosen a Green's function so that the gx derivative at x equals to zero is always zero. So all your heat contours always hit the boundary orthogonally if you haven't specified a boundary condition. And that you can understand simply as in the first case, what we were solving is roughly an infinite insulated bar where we gave the temperature at the edge. Here we've insulated the edge in this, in when we, if we don't provide a temperature source. I mean, if we don't provide basically Bn of T on the edge, right? So our edge is insulated. 
So the temperature basically flows that there's no, or the, the heat flows that there's no gradient over the edge. And this is what makes it enter, sort of our contours enter it orthogonally. So in some sense, this insulated edge will sort of keep the heat and prevent it from flowing away. And in general, make the bar at this edge hotter for, keep the bar at this edge hotter for longer than it would have been in a completely infinite solution without this Neumann boundary condition over here. Okay, so this is once again simply the effect of the initial condition and the fact that we've now taken Green's equation, found a Green's equation that satisfies the Neumann boundary conditions equals to zero with the, the boundary condition Gx is equals to zero on the boundary. So once again, it illustrates the difference, the, the Green's functions you've made as well as the assumptions you've made in trying to solve the problem. Now let's have a look at the, um, this effect of this boundary condition. So once again, in interpreting the boundary condition, what you're specifying is not the value of the boundary, but rather the gradient of the way the contours join the boundary when you give this thing. Okay, and you can see what that looks like. So I'm now going to give both the effect of this term over here and the effect of the boundary term together. Right, and what it basically does is when this boundary term, when you specify the boundary term, it basically corresponds to removing in some sense this insulated cap over the edge of your infinite rod for a brief period of time, allowing the colder um, heat to flow or allowing this edge to be exposed to the cold. It's no longer insulated from its environment. And the way you've specified it is simply to say that du dx is increasingly positive um, for this region of time. In other words, over here you basically have that your boundary conditions are still orthogonal, so your contours would still join the boundary perpendicularly. But the moment you sort of go past 0 0.5, increasingly you specifying that these contours and in fact du dx is positive so the temperature must increase increasingly as you go into the domain with respect to x. Okay and then when you pass 1.5 that condition is again relaxed over here and then your contours will join the side orthogonally. So it's very good to have an intuitive picture of what each one of these terms actually mean when you're solving the equations. And I've just superimposed this now on our, um, our initial condition. And it's important to know that the scale here isn't perfect, right? Because this scale here goes from 0 to, um, I think the maximum is like 0 0.6. Whereas this scale is adapted, this thing goes from minus 0 0.15, the blue. So that's not an absolute blue scale, right? It's not indicating temperature, but the value over here is minus because the minus ends there. You're basically draining away um, heat. Um, and then it goes to minus the maximum value over here, which is, um, yeah, basically the maximum value that's the, the you've specified du dx on the boundary over there. So it drains away a lot of heat. And then uh, it basically distorts the heat that's being provided from this initial condition over here. So I hope this gives you an intuitive feel for the types of solutions we get when you have Neumann conditions, as well as the impact they have on the actual solution. Um, and we will be looking at a confined domain in the next lecture. Thank you very much.